Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone who's joining us live for our Sabbath worship program. We thank you, my friends, for your presence here this morning, every one of you who have the time to join in. And we want to say thank you for those who are watching a little later. Today, I understand there is a lot of programs on and a lot of people are on varying programs. So if you're watching this later, thank you for watching. And um, it is always a pleasure. There is no time limit on when the Word of God is watched. So it's on. And if you're watching later on in the afternoon or during the course of the week, we thank you for taking the time to view this program. So all of you who are live currently on YouTube and on Facebook, Sister Linda Walker, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Brother Glenn Giron, good morning to you, sir. Happy Sabbath, Sister Zion Princess. We thank you all, Sister Gilded Weeks. God bless you and happy Sabbath. And so, my friends, we are grateful that God has led you here this morning so that you can receive, uh, sorry, we, sorry, not just you, we can receive from His Word. As you know, this completes another week of live programming here. We thank you for those of you who are with us on Sunday and for those of you who are with us on Thursday. This is the third service we have during the course of the week. This is the service. We have two programs on Sunday Night Quench and Living Water Thursdays. We always invite those who, have, who don't know that we have a YouTube channel to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Cisterns of Living Water, C-I-S-T-E-R-N-S, -E Cisterns of Living Water YouTube channel. All our content is on the YouTube channel every Sunday night quench, every Living Water Thursday program, and every Sabbath program is on the YouTube channel. Feel free to subscribe. Also hit the notifications button, the little bell. That way you know every time we go live or every time we load new content on there. And so uh, that concludes our announcements for today. Reminder that we are on tomorrow night, thanks, uh, God willing, the first day of the week, Sunday night quench. And we invite you all to be with us tomorrow evening. 
just before I speak, I want to play a song. There is a fountain filled with blood. That will be our hymn of meditation today, after which we will pray. And then, without further ado, get into the word of God. Welcome, Sister Miriam, Joan Alexander, and everyone else who has since logged yeah. into our YouTube and our Facebook. Good morning to you and happy Sabbath as well, Sister Naomi Met. I 
power to save. Sister Janice Niles, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Sister Vivian Felix, good morning and happy Sabbath. Sister Stephanie Simon, good morning to you, my dear sister. All the love out there in St. Lucia. Extend that to your family as well on behalf of myself. And extend that to the whole of Babono. Let them know I love them and I am praying and thinking about them. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. My friends, let us pray. Heavenly Father, now we get to the part where I disseminate the word as you have prepared it in me. Hallelujah. I pray, dear Father, that I will speak to all the understanding of your people. Mm -hmm. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will take this message to each ear that is listening, heart and mind, tailor it to fit them, how they need to hear it. Let it go to their edification. Let it go to each one of our growth. And for somebody watching this, let it go to their understanding of you as God and lead them into the acceptance of Jesus Christ for the saving of their soul. We know, dear Father, that your word never returns to you void. The power is not in my voice or in my stature. The power is in the Spirit of God bringing conviction to the hearts of men that your word is truth and through your word we can be sanctified. Amen. So let the power of your word take root and effect in every life. Amen. We pray this because we believe it by faith in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Sister Amen. Hermina Miro, good morning. Now, my friends, we are, at, we, we are at the third part of the evolution series. Those of you who have been here, I trust that you have received the word link by link, evolution one, natural selection, evolution two, survival of the fittest, and today we are concluding, Sister Linda Walker, with Evolution 3, Adapt or Die. Good morning, Sister Schirmer. Adapt or Die. If you've missed any one of the past sermons, you've missed a lot of information, I invite you to go to our YouTube channel. Today we are concluding Evolution 3, Adapt or Die. In the records of the world, the first automobile is said to have come out in 1885. Before automobiles, men walked or rode on horses or carts. If you look at the early stages and pictures of New York City, you will see in the streets, there are no cars, there are horse-drawn carriages. Some can, some can still be found in Central Park to maintain the nostalgia of it all, but that was the most common form of transportation. So before any car existed, men walked or they rode on horses. The first record of an airplane is 1903. Before that, men did what? Men got on ships and they traveled as long as it took to get to wherever they were going. Before you could jump on a plane and fly around the world, you had to patiently travel by ship. The first handheld cell phone is said to have been in 1983. Before then, yes, there were phones in houses, and before then, you actually had to use pigeons and different forms of messages, different forms of ways to get your messages across. In came a phone, transporting sound from one area to another. However, Man took it to a whole new level when he took what was in the house and the only way to call someone was from one house to another house. Men now held in their hand a cordless phone which they could reach each other anywhere they want to. Amen. In 1994 was the advance of the cell phone. It was just before a big device in your hand with digits that you 
press to call someone. Then in 1994, you have the development of the smartphone. You could do a lot more than just call, whether you text or whether you check your schedules. It wasn't until 2001 that you have now a whole other advance in the cell phone. You have cell phone to internet connection. You now held in your hand a computer. A computer was reserved for the home. Now you have in your hand a phone, a computer. The first iPhone in 2007. And so from that point to now, we understand how things have progressed in the world. Look at the way that men built homes before the simplicity in the building of the home to now the elaborate mechanisms that homes have become. Now you have smart homes where you speak and the lights come on. You speak to your refrigerator. You control everything through the cell phone. Even your toilet now is motion activated. The way that things have changed over the course of time. The way food is prepared. First, with just fire out there in the wild to now the stoves that we have. Now it's not enough to have a stove, you need a smart stove. Utilities have changed and money has changed the way men dealt with each other before in terms of exchanging goods one for another to the point now where we use money. What am I saying? I am saying to you today, what has man done in each of the stages of his existence? As things around man continue to change, man has adapted in every situation. Man has adapted to fit his time. He has adapted, she has adapted with each change in the society that surrounds them. When you look at the word adapt, what does it mean? It means to make something suitable for new use. That's one definition. The other definition is to become adjusted to new conditions. Simply put, that is what it means to adapt. Become adjusted to new conditions or make something suitable for a new form, for a new use. As you saw with the advancement of when you have one cell phone to now when you have a digital device that is capable of doing anything in your hand. I want to read an excerpt from the book Propaganda by Edward Bernays. And I begin, I quote, The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society consist of an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. They govern us by their qualities of natural leadership, their ability to supply needed ideas, and by their key position in the social structure. Whatever attitude one chooses to take this toward this condition, it remains a fact that in almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics, whether it is business, in our social conduct, or our ethical thinking, and I add to this, that's my own addition, even the religious thoughts and practices of many in the world, we are dominated relatively by a small number of persons. A trifling fraction of our 120 million who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind, who harnessed old social forces and contrived new ways to bind and guide the world. In the book, it says our tastes are governed. Everything that you and I purchase comes from propaganda. Propaganda, information, 
put out there telling us the things that we need to eat, the things that we need to wear, the type of products we need to use on our bodies, how to build our homes, how to conduct ourselves. Information is put out there on every single subject. That's why, for example, on one aisle of the supermarket, you have hundreds of varieties of cereal. Information, propaganda is put out on each. And when you step in the supermarket and I step in the supermarket, we get to pick whichever one appeals to our taste. However, it was already put out there. It was already put out there to appeal to us by a group of people who decided to put cereal on the market, put advertisements concerning cereal on the market. One may like it sweet, one may like it uh, salty, one may like it crunchy, one may like it soggy, or whatever it is, there is a product for you and I. And that, my friends, came from a group of people who got together, studied the tastes of societies and put the product in the society for it to be bought. And I extend that now, take this fragmented here and extend it to what I am trying to drive home this morning. Many people are building what is their concept of the world. Through the history of time, you and I come into this world and are living in someone's concept of it. What we have done is adapted to it. Men have tapped into the world. As I said before, when I began, they brought cars into existence, planes into existence. They have developed greater ships into existence. They have developed all sorts of products. You and I adapt to it. We adapt to the world that is being built and continually rebuilt around us. Adaptation is one of the biggest witnesses against man when it comes to God. I want to see men not in our minds this morning. One of the damning witnesses against man is the word adapt. Man was designed by his creator to adapt to whatever situation that he would face in this world. Even after sin, the, it was necessary for the bodily functions to adapt to a more corrupt surrounding. And so God designed the body to function in a certain way so that through the history of time, though degraded over time, man has adapted continually. The thing about man is men continue to request of others to adapt to their world as they created for societies. He wants people to adapt to his rules. Ultimately, their greatest creation is artificial intelligence. It is man's greatest creation to date. We hear and see of the ultimate progression that man has made in the world of artificial intelligence. We hear and see the ads that are put out there concerning the evolution of the metaverse. The metaverse is a step ahead from where we are right now as it comes to social media and how we interact with one another, how we approach living in this world. It is, in effect, virtual reality. Also, it is originated reality. What is the metaverse? It is a computer image projection of a real person's worldview. And this is where the world is headed, my brothers and sisters, that you and I tap in to the originated reality. We live in a world, whereas we live through a virtual reality of the world. We live through a computer's projection of the world. You see this in large part in the gaming world, where someone enters into the, the world of computers, creates a profile of themselves, and lives through and lives through an avatar. And the advancement of 
the computer age that we are in, is that human beings can actually create a world and live in it continuously online. A projected image of themselves online. That is man's greatest creation that he is continuing to harness and develop. Whereas you will have users, people, real people living in a digital universe. Real people living a projection of the world. You see, the thing about man is man understands ideally he cannot change the deterioration of the world. He cannot reverse the effects that sin has had on the world. So what man essentially is doing is creating not a real but fake world. He is creating a world of his own. And he's telling the conscious masses that you can live through what I previously said is an avatar. Now, an avatar, basically they call it an icon or a figure representing a person. But there is another aspect and interpretation of the word avatar. Avatar in Buddhist and Eastern religion is a manifestation of a deity or a released soul in bodily form on earth. It is an incarnate divine leader. There is a spirit attached to every orchestrated thing in existence that drives man to do what he does. In the computer projected world, your avatar essentially is your creation and you live in this world as you would you you maybe cannot live in your present circumstances but you live through your avatar and create the world that you really want away from the reality of this world and accepting a world that someone has created through a computer man tells us to adapt to his idea of the world, of artificial intelligence, or die. Man tells us, adapt to this smart world, or die. Adapt to the phones that we have given you. Adapt to the existence that we have given you through computers. You want to stay in your old mindset, either you adapt or die. And billions of people concur. With this concept. However, when God says adapt or die, what does man do? Man vilifies and criticizes God as controlling, as vindictive, as unloving, as non existent, because he says adapt or die, yet they willingly go as lambs to slaughter. When men tell them adapt to our world, or die. Man will accept life through an unreal yet spiritual entity called an avatar in the manufactured world of artificial intelligence. I want you to listen to my words very carefully. Many men and women will accept life through an unreal yet spiritual entity called an avatar and artificial intelligence in the manufactured world, yet he rejects God because he says God isn't real and that heaven is a figment of the Christian imagination. He will accept the unreal of artificial intelligence that plays on the mind, making you think it's real, but will not accept God's reality because he doesn't think heaven is real. Nevertheless, Revelation 22, Revelation 22, 10 to 12, the Bible says, the time is soon to come, where the Bible says, as God said to John, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, why, for the time is at hand, he that is unjust, what happens, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I come quickly. Behold, 
My reward is with me. I will give every man according as his work shall be. That is a reality in Revelation chapter 22, 10 to 12 of the coming sealing of all things. Where one who is unjust will be unjust as one who is holy will be holy. And when God comes, he will give a reward to every man according to that principle. Now look at Romans 6, 16. Romans 6 and verse 16. The Bible says, While your existence on this earth is happening, know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are or to whom you obey. Whether you obey sin unto death or whether obedience, sorry, whether of sin unto death, disobedience, or of obedience unto righteousness. Man says, adapt or die in my world. I don't care how you feel. My world is progressing through the computer age. Either you adapt or you fall behind. God does not just say adapt or die because it's a threat. Adaptation is not just some threat by the Almighty God. In Revelation 22 and in Romans chapter 6, adaptation is the reality of one's decision for or against God. That is the bottom line. When God says adapt or die, it is the reality of your decision that you are making right now. As I started this series with, and if you missed it, Catch it, my friends. Evolution is man's study of God's creation after it is corrupted by sin. There are many truths that are arrived through the study of evolution. Man takes evolution and tries to disprove God. That is not of God. That is wrong. But natural selection and uh, survival of the fittest and adaptation are keys to God's creation after sin. Evolution doesn't mean God doesn't exist. Evolution means men looked at the world after sin and its effects and they discovered some things concerning the world. God, however, wants us to understand this concept of evolution to all men, all scientists. Man is naturally selected to, to be a survivor, to be the fittest in this world, if only he will adapt. God wants man to understand, I designed you, that even when you fell, I am going to put measures into this world that will allow you to be restored from where you fell. I have selected you for this. And I have selected the process by which you now, man, in your fallen state, can become a survivor again. You can be fit again, if only you will adapt. And remember the definitions that I put forth of adaptation. It is making something suitable for new use. When man fell, he began to use his body to perpetrate all manner of evil. But God now says, I want to fit you and make you suitable for new use. And then I want you to become adjusted to your new conditions. The conditions of the world facilitate the progression of sin, the progression of godlessness. However, God says, the conditions that you exist in when you are in Christ, is a vast difference from the conditions of the world because I've called you out of it. So what we are doing today is we are looking at the three principles of adaptation that studies have put out there and how it applies to our spiritual reconstruction in Christ. Number one, when it comes to adaptation, this says there is structural, meaning the organism possesses a feature that helps it to survive. It possesses a feature that helps the organism to survive 
and to adapt. John 15. John chapter 15. And we are looking at verse 1. John 15, we are beginning at verse 1. The Bible says very clearly, Jesus stated very distinctly, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. I'm the vine. My father dresses the vine. My father nourishes the vine through me. I am rooted. We are rooted and grounded in Christ. Look at verse 4. What does he say? He says, abide in me, remain in me, dwell in me, and so forth, I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. He says, I am the vine, abide in me, be with me, merge with me, unite with me. And you are considered part of the vine. You are not distinct from me. You are part of me. You represent me. I nourish you. My father nourishes you. We are in you. You possess us as a feature. The Bible says. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. The branches are still considered part of the vine. There is no distinction between the branches and the vine, when you are in the vine. He says, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Jesus says, there is no losing or inadequacy when you are dwelling in me. If you are inadequate, check your standing. Are you where you are supposed to be? Because I am your feature. And being your feature in me, there is no loss. There is only gain, Christ says. When I am in you and you are in me, fruit is inevitable. That is a guarantee. There is no lack in that. Christ says that is distinct. Now go to John 10. John chapter 10, 27 to 30. John chapter 10. Listen to what the Bible says in John chapter 10. We are looking at 27 to 30. He says, what? My sheep, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My sheep, he says, my father gave them to me. My father who gave them to me is greater than all. He is the supreme of all the universe. No man is able to plug them out of my father's hand. You know why? Because my father and I are one, Christ says. So Christ says, when you find yourself lost, when you find yourself confused, you need to check, are you really following me? Are you in me? Are you abiding in me? Are you with me as you are supposed to be? Because you see, Christ says, I never let you go. I never chase you away. Amen. I never lead you down the wrong path. The only people who lead you down the wrong path, Christ says, are blind leaders. Mm. He says, woe be unto the pastors that scatter my sheep. Because Christ says, I do not scatter my sheep. Your overseers that have been placed over you are the ones doing the scattering. Mm. So Christ says, I need you to understand, who are you following? Are you following someone who leads you to me? Because I am the good shepherd. Any under shepherd, any, sorry, any, any um, overseer that I have put over my sheep ought to be leading you to my flock so that I can keep you. No mortal man can keep you. Mortal man gives you the information of the one that keeps you. And so he says, you ought to learn my voice. Any man you subject yourself to listening to must be speaking as the oracle of God. He must be speaking according to the spirit of God in him, speaking. If he speaks of himself, my brothers and sisters, you are already down the wrong path. 
Because the Lord says, when I send my spirit, he is going to testify of me, Jesus says. Not even of himself. He will testify of the one in whom the way exists. The way to the Father. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man comes into communion with the Father outside of Christ. And so he says, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep will follow me. He says, and in the process that my sheep are following me, my sheep are guaranteed eternal life. Which is why it is imperative now for men and women to get in touch with Christ. And to, and to be in places where you are led to be in touch with Christ. Not to be part of one man's flock, but the flock of Christ. Amen. So the Bible says, listen, when you are following me, you are assured of eternal life. It is given to you. It is the gift that I have given to you. It is the crowning achievement of your existence. Because your earthly existence leads you to the grave. Mm. But Christ says, the crowning achievement of being with me is eternal life. You can rest assured in that. And he says, no man is able to pluck you out of my hand when you are with me. He says, listen, the only reason you are confused and with every wind of doctrine is because you are not growing in the truth. Maybe you're taught wrong. Maybe you're only following a form of religion. Maybe you, you have not really been cemented, he says, when you ought to be uh, uh, teaching, you are still drinking the milk. You are still students of the word. He says there is progression when it comes to me. I want every one of you to be able to stand because when you are truly in me, God says, no man will pluck you out of my hand. You can hear a false prophet a mile away. Mm. Brother Malcolm, don't need to tell you there's a false prophet around the corner. You just, he just has to teach you to be in Christ, in the word, the spirit of God in you. And then you are free to stand and listen and know a false prophet a mile away. Amen. Because I and my father are one and we want to make our abode with you. Now go to John 17. John 17, 1 to 3. Listen to what the Bible says. John 17. Jesus prayed this, brothers and sisters, when he said, The hour is come, glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. You have given him power over all flesh. And because of that, he gives eternal life to as many as you have given him. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Know thee is intimate speech, intimate encounter with Christ, as Abraham knew Sarah, his wife, intimately. Abraham, uh, sorry, Adam knew Eve, and Becain, Adam knew Eve and Be Abel. You and I know Christ and we bear fruit in righteousness. God is talking about intimacy here. God is talking about close union with Christ, not a plutonic relationship. It is a deep, personal, intimate relationship you and I have with Christ and we bear the fruit of that relationship. We don't try to bear the, the fruit, then have a relationship with Christ. No. We don't try to manifest the fruits of the Spirit by willing ourselves into it. Christ says, my prayer, I am praying for my bride. I am praying for you, Christ says, that you may understand the concept of God and I in you. Through the Spirit of God that I will send as the one to baptize you thoroughly. Hmm. Amen. First John 4, 17. Let the scriptures connect and, and speak. First John 4. First John chapter 4 and verse 17. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, Herein is our love made perfect, that you and I may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. He has made it possible that you and I can live righteously in this world. We can shine as lights in a cruel and adulterous generation. 
That's why he deals with it from the inside and it manifests itself on the outside. Hmm. That's why it is visibly seen. There is a production in the child of God that is experienced within and shown without. There is a love that the children of God experience in this world that is not experienced by the world and it is distinct before the world and it is seen because Jesus says, men will know you are my disciples when they see you. And so this is what we are referring to when we are dealing with structural as it comes to adaptation. What is in us? What is the feature that we possess that causes us to adapt? To the surroundings that God has placed for us. Number two. There is another one called physiological. Where you have the feature. And now the body process helps the organism to survive. You have the feature. And there is a process the body goes through. That helps the organism to survive. Based on the feature that they possess. Go to Luke 22, 31 and 32. That's why I tell you, my brothers and sisters, not be afraid when men use words like evolution to run. Men use words to make themselves think as that they are more intellectually sound than others. Mm -hmm. But the Spirit of God takes the simplest of things and brings understanding to his people. Amen. Whereas I never, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor in anything, I'm just taught by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says in Luke 22, 31 and 32, what did the Lord say to Simon? He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan have desired to have you that he may do what? That he may sift you as wheat. But he says, what must happen, Simon? He says, I have prayed for you, Simon, mm -hmm. that your faith, fail not. Amen. And he said, listen, Simon, when you are converted, mm -hmm. I, I, listen to the assurance that Jesus gave to Peter, still in an unconverted state. Mm -hmm. He didn't say if, Simon, if you are converted. He said, Simon, when? I knew you from your mother's womb. I saw you a long time ago, Simon, fishing and I knew, Simon, what your purpose in this world is. Jesus says, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. You have a particular work to do, Simon, that even your brethren may not understand. Listen, I understand you're always the one to run ahead and answer questions. Well. I understand that you're the guy to first pull the sword mm. and start hacking away. <laughs> I understand that every time I speak, you come and speak behind me, Simon. Well, well, well. So Christ says, you in your current condition, as I will call Paul later on, mm -hmm. in his fervence to kill, I see what you can be in my hands. Mm -hmm. So he says, Simon, when you are converted, when the Spirit of God is upon you, when Amen. I am in you Amen. and Amen. God is in you, when you possess me as a feature, then your body process, your body will go through a process mm -hmm. that helps you to survive. Amen. So Christ makes, makes the proclamation on the life of Peter. Now go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26 and verse 73. Matthew 26. 73. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, Now Simon, post this conversation with Christ, is in a circle of people. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, He denied in verse 72 an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him, they that stood by and says to Peter, Surely you are one of them, Peter. Mm -hmm. And here is why we say, Surely you are one of them. You are one of them because your speech, Peter, <laughs> is betraying you. Well, you are not speaking like the Peter that you once were. Well, well, you have something as a feature that is affecting your speech. Mm -hmm. And so your speech betrays you 
that you are with you were with this man. Well, so now Peter possesses Christ as a feature. It has affected his speech. For Peter to prove that he is not with Christ, he has to revert back to something that was not comfortable for him anymore. Cursing and swearing was comfortable for Peter once. Now the Bible says he began to curse and he began to swear, saying, I know not the man to which the cock now crew and Peter recognizing himself, he wept bitterly. Because he understood the level of betrayal that had gone into what he just did. And he remembered the man that he had walked with. Amen. And it was no longer comfortable for Peter to curse and swear. Amen, amen. So he had to revert back to what he no longer was, my brothers and sisters. Mm, amen, now, hallelujah. it didn't stop there. Remember Jesus said, you were going to be converted and you will strengthen your brethren. Go to Acts chapter 1. Mm. Peter needed this moment so that he could gain understanding. It may have been one of his lowest moments, but he has not been given up by God. Acts chapter 1, 13 to 14. Acts 1, the Bible says, when they came into the upper room, who was there? Peter, mm -hmm. along with the other apostles. What did the Bible say in verse 14? They all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the brethren. So Peter now is following the principles of God in which he's abiding in the place where his change will be cemented and take effect. Mm -hmm. As in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit of God came upon them and they were prophesying in the name of Jesus. And the men said that they are nothing but a bunch of drunks who stood up. The Bible says in verse 12 of Acts chapter 2, they ask the question, what mean of this action that is taking place? But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said, you men of Judea, and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. We are not drunken as you suppose, this is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. That in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. This is the fulfillment of the prophetic event that God said would happen in the outpouring of his spirit upon his people to disseminate the gospel. Go a little bit further now. Acts chapter 4. Look at verse 7. After, after Peter, the Bible says, And John healed the man at the temple. We have them now in the midst of the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the leadership of the time. And they asked Jesus, so sorry, they asked Peter, by what power... Or by what name have you done this? Remember, Peter was a guy at the arrest of Jesus where they told him you had been with Jesus and he denied it. Now Peter is being asked by the leadership of the Jews, by what power, by what name have you done this? Mm -hmm. Peter now is a different man completely. Peter says, Filled with the Holy Ghost, Hallelujah. you rulers of the people, Hallelujah. elders of Israel, Amen. if we be examined this day of the good deed done to the impotent man, mm -hmm. be it known unto you all, unto all people of Israel, mm -hmm. by the name mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Amen. whom you crucified, God raised from the dead, even by him. Does this man stand here before you whole? Amen. Are you looking at the body process? Hmm. What Peter is going through. Peter possesses something as a feature. And now there is a process that he is going through. Now he is able to stand and proclaim bold witness. He says, listen, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, hmm. which has become the head of the corner. There is, neither is there salvation in any other. 
For there is none other name under heaven yes. given among men Amen. whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah. Do you know what they saw? The people around the campfire where Peter denied Christ, they saw the weakness of Peter. Mm -hmm. In this instance in the temple, the Bible say, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, Amen. they perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men. Mm -hmm. But they marveled and took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. Amen. They didn't even they didn't need to ask. Peter was now speaking boldly on behalf of Christ, not denying him. Now go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Peter 1 and verse 2. Listen to the word of God in 1 Peter 1 2. The Bible says. Who are we talking about? Verse 1 of First Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered through Pontius and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, you and I today, wherever we are. What is Peter describing? him? He wrote this. Peter wrote this. The Bible says he wrote of himself. He left according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Peter recognizes that God knew him from his mother's womb. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience. You see how it works? We receive this thing in us. It takes root and effect as a feature, and then it manifests itself outside. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, Grace and peace be multiplied. That's the process. What the body goes through upon the receiving of the Spirit of God within. Our actions now are motivated by the Spirit of God. And our boldness doesn't just come in our natural state of being. It comes from the empowering of God's Spirit unto bold witness. Mm -hmm. Romans 6, Romans 6, let's read from verse 8. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with Christ. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death do not have dominion over him anymore. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. That is our state of existence. Liken he re likewise... Reckon he also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And for you now, let not sin reign in your mortal body, mm -hmm. that you should obey it. Do not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness, because you have yielded your members unto Christ, dwelling in you mm -hmm. unto salvation. Through righteousness. The Bible says, Sin shall not have dominion under you. You are not under the law. You are under grace. You are living in Christ. Christ in you. You have been sacrificed unto Christ. Your bodies. And you are now the temple of the living God. So there is a process that God has asked us to undertake by which his magnificent work is done in us and through us. And the last stage when it comes to adaptation is behavioral, which is you have the feature, you have the body process, and then you have the responses of the organism. Now, they have taken this in the study of evolution, and they have studied animals and man as things continue to change in the world, climate changes, and different surroundings change, the organism adapts, to the surrounding and it acts according to the surrounding that's why i said at the start everything was in perfect symmetry the minute sin entered uh, uh um you have a corrupt nature mm -hmm. that has set into man and to the world mm -hmm. and so men begin to work at variance one with the other men and women men against men women against m women we have the animals taking on a different feature there is now a disconnect between man and animals. Hmm. The, 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 the one he once named and caressed 
and pet in the garden now will kill him. Mercy. Because all are trying to defend themselves in a cruel and adulterous world. Hmm. However, God also facilitated that when his image is restored in man mm -hmm. and the body goes through the process of sanctification, the body begins to behave in a certain way. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, 5. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the the pro, the the um the mind where all our decisions are established alongside with the heart. We have the brain, yet we have the function of the mind that deals with perception and also deals with reasoning and decision making. It is the seat where decisions are made. It is the seat where we process what we see, what we smell, what we taste. What we touch, our emotions expressed through the heart, but still processed through the mind. Mm -hmm. So we have a response now, a different response from the mind when we are living outside of God as opposed to being in God. Mm -hmm. We are Man is now selfish, processing survival of the fittest. Mm. Kill or be killed. Mm. Make money no matter what it takes. Get status no matter what it takes. He experiences jealousy, hatred. Mani they, they manipulate, manipulate his thoughts yeah. to murder, to mm -hmm. lying, to cheating, mm -hmm. to stealing. Mm -hmm. But God says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. Look at 1 Peter 2.21. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. In Christ, the Bible says, listen. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. The Bible says, Even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He committed himself to his father. His mind was the mind of heaven. His focus was heaven. He did not, he was not distracted by his earthly circumstances. Nope. You and I live in a world full of distractions. Mm -hmm. You and I live in a world that men continue to build and create and ask us to adapt. But when we adapt to the world that men have created, we adapt also to projecting selfishness, mm -hmm. protecting thinking gain is godliness. Mm -hmm. We also usurp authority one over another. Mm -hmm. We experience false perceptions of love. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our relationships are not healthy. But and so my brothers and my sisters, Christ also walked this world, lived in this world, and set an example. You walk above the world. Your survival is not contingent upon your status. Mm. Your survival is not Amen. contingent upon your standing in church. Mm. Your, your survival Amen. is not conducive to the things you do to feed the poor. Mm. He says you will do these things, but you do them through the mind of Christ. Amen. You don't do them to purchase your way to righteousness. Amen. You do them because you are righteous. Amen. You do them because Hallelujah. the mind of Christ is your mind. Mm -hmm. You process the world differently. You make decisions differently. Even when you are persecuted. Even when you are treated wrongly. Even when you are mocked and cursed at. Hallelujah. You still have the mind of Christ. The Bible says. Your thought process is different. Because you have the mind of Christ. As the feature has said in, the body process goes through. You are directed by the spirit, but the spirit of God controls all your functions. The spirit of God motivates your thought. The spirit of God influences your decision. Now, go to Matthew 6.22. Mm -hmm. 
Matthew 6 and verse 22. The Bible says, wait a minute, the light of the body is the eye. Hmm. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body is full of light. Hmm. But if that eye that you have is evil, your whole body is full of darkness. Hmm. Wait a minute. If <laughs> the light that is in you be darkness, how great is yeah. the darkness? The deciding factor when it comes to the processing of information is primarily the eye. Every time you turn on the television, every time you scroll through your cell phone, every time you go on Facebook to check your content, how many people like you, how many friends you have, whatever social media account, well, your eyes continue to receive information. Many people find gratification in their statuses online which is fed through their eyes, settles in their minds. And if someone doesn't like them online, it has a great impact on their lives. Mm -hmm. They want to see who gets more views than the other. Mm -hmm. They want to see who is more popular than the other. Mm -hmm. They project their lives through their online avatars, mm -hmm. how they really want to live, mm -hmm. how they really want to dress, how they really want to speak. Some people through gaming, you can really see what is their intention. Hmm. When they create somebody in the virtual reality world, they can perform crime never being prosecuted because I didn't do it. I did it through my avatar. I can be whatever I want online away from the responsibility what? of my actions. The Bible says what you take in is very important. Your eyes here perform the function of taking in light because the natural process of sight is light reflecting on an object and your eyes picking up the object. But it is in your mind that you know what you are watching. You see, that's how sight works. It's not just your eyes. Your mind tells your eyes what you are watching. Hmm. So when you open this Bible here and I tell you to go to John 3.16, I, as a leader, can also tell you what John 3.16 means. Hmm. Now, it may not be true, hmm. but you have submitted yourselves to me to tell you what John 3.16 means. Hmm. And because you like me, you hold me in high esteem, well, you take what I say. Well, so when you see John 3.16... Even when you see something in John 3.16 that says, maybe Brother Malcolm Emile is wrong. Hmm. I have also taught you not to listen to that voice. Because I'm right. I'm the end all be all. Okay. So every time you look at John 3.16, you're going to see my interpretation only. So the Bible says, when you have light in you that is darkness, false teachings of the word, false understandings of the word that is great darkness because you actually think you have light in you hmm. my brothers and my sisters is where the bible says test the spirits yep. against the word prayerfully consider this message and say lord is brother emile right, right. and he will convict you that is right or he will not but my brothers and my sisters the bible says let your eye be single. Mm -hmm. Let your eye be purposefully focused on God. Amen. Let your mind be thoroughly under the teaching of the Spirit of God. Amen. And test everything that has a name outside of God. Hmm. And if it's right, accept it with open arms. Amen. Receive the teaching. For it is for the glory and honor of God. The Bible says your eye must be focused. It must be single. It must be directed to heaven so that your mind can be developed by God. Mm -hmm. Look at Titus 2 and verse 1. Titus 2 and verse 1. It behooves God's people in these modern time, in these continuous times to really understand what's going on in the world. My brothers and my sisters. Titus 2 
and verse 1. The Bible says, I want you, Timothy, as Paul wrote, speak the things that become sound doctrine. Amen. Now, Amen. you don't just speak it because you heard it and you just want to regurgitate it. Hmm. The Bible says, speak the things that become sound doctrine. The things that you have been taught by God, convicted by God, the truth of God. For righteous living, God says, speak the thing that becomes sound teaching. Teaching that you can stand on. A foundation of God that, you can, that your house can be builded on. Speak the things that are in you, cemented in you, taught by God to you. Hmm. Now it may be from a teacher of God. Hmm. But that's why you have to be careful who you are submitting yourselves to be taught by. Amen. Because the man or, or the man who's teaching you ought to himself have been given sound doctrine. Amen. His house must be built on one foundation. Hallelujah. Not his name. Hmm. Not his status. Yes. Other foundation. Yes. Can no man lay hmm. than that which is already laid. Hallelujah. You and I are continuously built on the the apostles' doctrine, which was built on Christ. Amen. And so you and I are to understand who we are subjecting ourselves to being taught by. And so it's important, the Bible says, that when you speak, what comes out of you is what was put in you by God. That's why Jesus Christ told the, told the Pharisees, what do you care? That my apostles don't wash their hands when they eat. Mm -hmm. Inside of you is already filthy. Well, well, well. When they don't wash their hands and they eat, don't worry. I have purified their insides with my word. You have rejected my word, so your hands are clean, but your belly is polluted. Hmm. Because what comes out of your mouth is hate. Hmm. What comes out of your mouth is plotting to kill the Son of God. What comes out of your mouth in your prayers is that you're better than others. You tithe everything that you have. You broaden the phylacteries on your garments. You want the high seats in the synagogue. You walk around having men bow to you. You are corrupt on the inside. You're a cemetery. You're whitened sepulchers, God said. Hmm. You don't speak the things that become some doctrine because my word is not in you. I'm not in you. So when Paul says to Timothy, speak the things which become sound doctrine, speak what God has put in you. Amen. We got the mind. We got the eyes. We got the mouth. Let us continue. Let us continue in Colossians 4, 6. Colossians 4, 6 as we wind down. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. The Bible says, let your speech be always grace, always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer, not just any, but every man. Too many Christians in the world today falsely represent God because they don't know how to speak. Too many Christians are tongue-tied by atheists and apostates in the world today because they are not, the Bible says, convicted of God's word. Mm -hmm. The Bible says you ought to be able to give an answer hmm. for what you believe. Yes. Especially in these times. Mm -hmm. You don't have to run call your pastor. Mm -hmm. He himself may not even be grounded Mercy. in the word. The Bible says, let your speech be grace seasoned with salt. God convicting you of his word. And you will know definitely how to answer every single man. That comes in your path. Mm -hmm. That is the growth of the word. That is the growth that God has facilitated. <clears throat> for you and I. Look at Psalm 90. And verse 12. The Bible says. Here is the principle. For the child of God. The Bible says in Psalm 90 and verse 12. So Lord. Teach us to number our days. Amen. Teach us Lord to understand how important. Every single day above ground is. Teach us, Lord, how to understand. The fact that we woke up this morning is a blessing. Teach us, Lord, to take serious stock 
of the days, the weeks, the months, the years that we have already been given. So that what? We may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. Amen. Teach us, Lord, to understand how important it is for us to know you intimately. For us to love knowing you. Cherish knowing you. Hmm. We don't want to live without you. Hallelujah. What, we you, Jesus. what, what did we use them sing? <laughs> he fills me up. He gives me love. Um, he is all the man that I ever need. I, she said, I used to cry myself to sleep at night. Mm. But that was all before he came. I thought love had to hurt to work out right. But now he's here. It's not the same. It's not the same. People keep singing love songs to false people. Well, What she really well, needed was God. Hallelujah. Because he fills us up. Hallelujah. He gives us love. Hallelujah. More love than we ever we need. He's all I've got in this world. Mm -hmm. He is all the man that I need. Hallelujah. Teach us, Lord, to understand we are nothing without you. Teach us, Lord, to understand that every single day with you is dead night. Hmm. Teach us, Lord, to love knowing of you. Amen. To love the opening of our Bible and connecting with you. Lord. Teach us, Lord, so that we can have our hearts circumcised. So that we can truly understand the length and breadth of your love. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Colossians 3, 12. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another forgiving one another if you have a quarrel the bible says as christ forgave you you must do also bowels of mercy don't just come in how i construct a ministry to work i go feed people on thanksgiving mm -hmm. and i believe i've done the work of god i have bowels of mercy because i gave ten dollars this week to somebody mm -hmm. the lord said this is a consistent ever abiding thing in the presence of his people he says put it on it is a feature bowels of mercy don't just work for family alone it works for enemies as well so the bible says have these things developed in you above all these put on charity it is the bond of perfectness it is how i will continue my work in you because you understand the lengths i went to forgive you the lens I went to display my love to you. And so you yourselves will be merciful and patient and understanding of others who have not yet got it. You will help facilitate their development, not their destruction. Go to Romans 10, 15 for our final scripture. Romans 10 and verse 15. The Bible says, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The primary purpose that God has his people here on earth is that they find it for themselves, be convicted of the gospel of Jesus Christ, receive Christ into their lives, walk with Christ for the duration of their lives and amidst all that represent Christ to the world of darkness. You and I must understand that principle that we don't just run off because we heard something. We are sent by God to live and preach his gospel. It is incumbent upon the person who is delivering to understand. They themselves must partake. Otherwise, they are a hypocrite. But the Bible says, blessed are those who have received Christ, who are convicted of Christ, and share Christ to the world. So my brothers and my sisters, adaptation is key. Our world 
in this current state of existence is not just our immediate surroundings. We live in it. But the conditions that God has placed for us to live is for us to abide in him, he in God, they in us. These are the conditions that we live in. The condition that we live in is that our bodies are the temple of the living God. Amen. This is where God lives. This is where he comes and makes his abode with us through the baptism and dwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it is in these conditions that we adapt and allow ourselves to be a perfect, completed, to be perfect, a completed work of art by Christ. The man who was once a drunkard, now only drinking the living water. The man and woman who was a glutton, only feeding themselves on the word of God. The man and woman who took lives, now save lives. The man and woman who cheated and stole, now give all they have to others in need. The man and woman who was a liar above liars, a corn man or woman, now only speaks and represents the truth. Mm -hmm. A man and woman who was marked for death in sin, now marked for eternal life through the righteousness of Christ mm -hmm. in God. Amen. My brothers and sisters, may we mm -hmm. allow ourselves to continue, no, sorry, may we allow ourselves to adapt to the principles that God has set forth for our salvation. Amen. And if you have, may you continue the walk. If today you have not yielded yourselves to, a, to the adaptation put in place by God, know that you are yielding yourselves to the adaptation of men unto destruction. Hmm. It is time to allow yourselves to come to know Christ and adapt to his life-saving principles. Amen. Heavenly Father, for the past three weeks, I have presented on this word that you have impressed upon my heart. To have your people understand that you have initiated a process by which we go from fallen man and women mm -hmm. to those who are saved in Christ. I pray, dear Father, that for the past three weeks, your Holy Spirit has spoken to someone. Amen. Number one, to give their lives to you. Number two, to be strengthened in knowing that walking with you is the highest walk that any man or woman can have in this world. Amen. We need not be ashamed of it. There is no weakness in it. There is no wavering in it. We are not timid. We stand and we represent you with boldness. I pray, dear Father, if anybody had the wrong concept of what this walk is and what this process is, that you would help them, that they would have understood it today, and that they can further study to test and see for themselves. I pray that your people will understand the need for an independent relationship with you, outside of the pleasing of men, but the pleasing of God. And I pray, dear Father, whatever this, whatever, uh, the, this time has failed to do, that your Holy Spirit will continue the work within the hearts and minds of all those who watch this. I pray, dear Father, that your great work will be done because as I hold fast to the promise that your word never returns unto you void, I know for sure that your word will do what it needs to do in each one of our lives. Amen. And so, dear Father, I thank you. I praise you. I glorify you. No praise and honor to me. All praise and glory to God. I pray for your people that need special prayer today. Some of them have needs. Whatever the need is, visit every single situation and let your name be known in the life of someone who needs you right now. Amen. We, we are dismissed with your blessing. We give you all praise and glory for the remainder of your blessings through the day. Keep us until the next time we meet. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My friends. I want to thank you. Amen, Sister Naomi. Knowing Christ is knowing who you truly are. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank the Lord for speaking us, speaking to us. Amen. Sister Brenda, teach us, Lord, to be loyal to you. Praise the Lord. 
And so, my friends, thank you for joining us this morning. I pray that the Lord has spoken to you. If you've missed any one of these sermons, they're on our YouTube channel. You can watch them again, share them as needed. Thanks to all of you who leave a thumbs up and who leave a comment of encouragement. Thank you for all your prayers. And thank you for all those who take the time to share this word from the Lord. May God bless you and keep you. Those of you who are watching later on today or during the course of the week, may God bless you and may God continue to speak to you. And for all those of you who God is using to spread his word in any way that he has inspired you to do so, may God continue to use you to brighten the corner wherever you are. There are no useless servants in the vineyard of God. Every one of you has a purpose. May you continue to fulfill the purpose of letting your light shine in the world. God bless you, my friends. Thank you for joining us again and for this uh, Sabbath program. We look forward to a new week of programming beginning with Sunday Night Quench through next week. Thank you, Sister Arthur. Selena Walker, Glenn Giron, Gilded Weeks, Naomi Met, but Jesus' blood and righteousness, Sister Luem, sneaking away in church to listen to the program, Agnita Baptiste, Nigel Niles and Janet Niles, my dear sisters, blessings to you, Sister Vivian Felix, and Stephanie Simon, Nina Miro, Dorsey Natron, blessings, all of you, Veronica Lewis, Sia Thomas, Sandra Jordan, Marcus Theodore, blessings my brother, brother Marcus I want to thank you for all your support, I know you always watch, Vanette Charles, Maisie Fannis, Berta Martin, Sister Brenda Samuel, Mary Eugene, Show me be Harry. Hope all is well in Grenada. Blessings to you. My dear aunt, Noella Nestor. Blessings to you. Give my love to Advent Fellowship. Correct Gabriel Lewis. Sister Carol Smith. For you, Sister Carol, love blessings. Sister Catherine Lansico. Always a blessing, my dear cousins. My dear mother number two, Caroline Ernest. Thank you, Sister Anita. Thank you. Sister Shuma, blessings to you, sis. Sister Zion Princess. Sister Miriam Joan Alexander, blessings. Sister Camelia Arthur, blessings to you. Sister Shaney Compton, my love to the rest of your sisters. God bless you. Happy Sabbath all. All of you are on. Your names may not be there, but you're watching. God bless you. You're watching after this is live. On Christ, the solid rock. All of us stand. All on the ground is sinking sand. May God bless you for the remainder of this day and the coming week, my brothers and sisters. Amen, Sister Nalja. Keep the faith. Oh, may in him be found, clad in his righteousness, faultless to stand on Christ, all on the ground. Is sinking sand. Thank you, Sister Lamina. Blessings, folks.